start the plenary on caring for patients with stroke, the role of the internist. And it's my greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Martin Cooper from Kings Mill Hospital, Mansfield. Over to you, Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Anodra, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for the invitation to your country, and it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking at this conference. Um, just recently, as celebrations for the uh, 70th anniversary of the NHS in the UK, my hospital invited me to write a little article about my experiences in the NHS. I, I hope they didn't feel I'd been there all that 70 years. I certainly haven't. Um, but I did reflect that certainly when I started my career, there was no such specialty as stroke medicine, and things have changed considerably since that time. Um, so why are we talking about stroke? Well, you don't need me to tell you that stroke is uh, very common. And incident studies here in Sri Lanka have suggested, sorry, prevalence studies have suggested a prevalence of one in 100. And perhaps one in six of us might expect to have a stroke uh, during our lives. Uh, it's certainly very serious, of course, and it's uh, here in Sri Lanka, it's the fourth commonest cause of death. Uh, that's more deaths due to stroke than um, due to um, malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS combined. And of course, it's the, uh, a leading cause of uh, adult disability. Uh, but more so, it's, it's very misunderstood. People think that stroke only affects old people. Um, people think that stroke is untreatable. And also that there's no preventative strategies. And again, a local study has shown that um, a, a third of all, uh, of all the general public would, more, would not even know that a stroke was affecting the brain primarily. Um, Two-thirds would think that there are no effective treatments, and really only a third of people uh, had any satisfactory, reasonable satisfactory knowledge of stroke. Um, so, but, stroke's serious, yes, but why um, stroke for the internist? Um, well, as you know, there are stroke units developing within the country, but I, I think to date I'm right in saying there's only about nine stroke units in the whole country. And... Um, in terms of neurologists, um, I think there's only about 45 neurologists or some figure like that. So clearly it can't be the neurologists looking after, after all the stroke patients. So as internists, as general physicians, you will of course see stroke on the general medical take. Um, stroke very much is a medical emergency. It comes on rapidly. Um, it has a poor prognosis, especially if left untreated. And it, but we do have treatments, and it may well be that a stroke patient uh, requires urgent treatment. Many of you will be familiar with the FAST, um, um, the FAST program, uh, which is designed to help the general public recognize the features of stroke. And, and making, for us as physicians as well, making a prompt and accurate diagnosis is, is a crucial part of the management of stroke. Um, the FAST test looks at uh, facial weakness, arm weakness, and speech deficits. And if there's two or more of these uh, deficits present, then the, uh, the likelihood ratio of this being a stroke is very high. However, um, if, the, if the score is zero, then the likelihood ratio is very low. Uh, the FAST test is great at identifying strokes in the anterior circulation, but less good at posterior circulation stroke identification. So strokes, patients presenting with dizziness, with diplopia, all sorts of those um, myriad conditions that you'll be used to, really are not picked up by this tool. But a new tool called the BFAST test adds in the examination of balance and looking for hemianopia, so eyes, balance and eyes, looking at hemianopia and diplopia. And adding in these tools certainly makes it more likely that we can confidently diagnose stroke. This tool uh, was developed, the Rosia tool, to help um, ED physicians especially identify stroke patients. So adding in the positive features of uh, the FAST test with the negative features of um, early loss of consciousness, syncope, 
and seizures which are less likely to be attributed to stroke helps us more confidently recognize stroke. But even so, things can still be difficult. And here's a, a list of some common features. Um, those on the left-hand side that would uh, make a stroke diagnosis more likely and those on the right-hand side less likely. The OCSP classification or the Bamford classification being uh, those syndromes of uh, total anterior, partial anterior, posterior and lacuna uh, strokes that you may be familiar with. But even so, even using these, the, um, seizures, syncope and sepsis will account for about a quarter of all suspected strokes. But of course, we do have effective treatment, and this has been around for some years. Um, but the uptake of um, thrombolysis it has been slow. That was true in the US when, uh, where it was first licensed, true in the UK, and certainly true in, here in Sri Lanka. And um, thrombolysis rates stand currently at around 3% uh, for patients treated in available centers. But of course, um, most centers don't yet have that availability. So why hasn't uh, thrombolysis been taken up more uh, readily? Well, there are certainly barriers to treatment, um, some of which we can, as physicians, be very much influenced in, but some of which we perhaps have to lobby for more central change. Lack of public awareness, um, I've talked about. Difficulty accessing hospitals, so the lack of um, difficulty with transport, with ambulances in rural areas. But there's also reluctance on the part of physicians. Um, and th these are some of the, the perceived difficulties that f physicians um, suggest. So a lack of neurology support, lack of radiology support, again, not things that we individually perhaps can influence. And I, I would suggest that we don't always need detailed radiological in interventions, and the majority of strokes, I would suggest, can be looked after not by a... don't, don't need the, uh, a neurologist to look after them, but can be looked after by a more generalist. But certainly physicians are worried about bleeding post-thrombolysis and also express a lack of um, belief in the efficacy. Well, let's try and um, talk about that in a little while. When we deliver thrombolysis, we have discussions about uh, risks and benefits with patients. And we say that there can certainly be benefit uh, with thrombolysis. And the NIHSS score is a scale ascribed to stroke patients with a more severe stroke having a higher score. A score of three might be someone uh, with hemianopia and dysphasia. So treatment that can return an improvement of three or more is certainly very effective. And thrombolysis is undoubtedly a powerful tool. When we talk with patients, we use this little schema. Um, uh, I'll just try and find the pointer. Is that... On the, on the top, so if we imagine we give patients, um, 100 patients with stroke uh, IV thrombolysis, then the top figures in green, about a third of those patients will improve better than they would have done without the treatment. Clearly, some patients will improve spontaneously, just as some patients will deteriorate spontane spontaneously. But a third will improve better than they would have done without the treatment, whereas about three out of every 100 will deteriorate because of the treatment that we've given them. Um, of course, it's important to deliver the treatment quickly. Here's a graph of the effect of treatment uh, over time. And the horizontal line is unity. So any treatment above that line is effective. Any treatment below that line is less effective. And the solid curve is the mean uh, treatment uh, effect. Which, um, and the dotted line is the standard 95% confidence intervals. And you can see that those confidence intervals cross unity at four, four and a half hours, um, meaning that at four and a half hours, the treatment is possibly as likely to be ineffective as effective. Um, but in terms of uh, hemorrhage, there's also uh, concerns and to some degree myths. Um, I'd like you to concentrate on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the graph uh, here. Um, and on the top, on the top figure um, is the uh, looking at stroke um, time to treatment. And in the middle, the two bars are age. And you can see that the risk of hemorrhage is not increased with either of those, but it is increased with stroke severity. Putting all this together then, these are data I'm um, grateful to William Whiteley from Edinburgh to share in these slides. And this is data really reflecting 
um, the SITS most thrombolysis registry. And each box, each grid is 100 patients. And what would happen if you gave 100 patients the treatment? Uh, along the top, the columns are looking at on the left uh, if no treatment were given. In the middle, if treatment were given between zero and three hours. And on the right, if treatment were given between three and four and a half hours. The rows down the side, the top row is for patients with mild stroke, middle patients with intermediate stroke, and at the bottom, severe strokes. The colors are the modified ranking scores, and really just concentrate on the colors, um, that red and orange are very good outcomes, independent, um, yellow, minimal independence, and poor outcomes of being dependent or uh, immobile or indeed dead are the green, purple, and blue. And you can certainly um, see improvements. Let's, let's just look at that in more detail. So this is for mild stroke patients. So just to recap, in the middle is those treated early, the left is those not treated, and the right is those um, treated later. And you can see there's benefit across the, across the board there uh, for all patients. So with a greater part of that grid looking uh, red and orange. So we see that again in patients with moderately severe stroke. Again, a greater proportion with the good outcomes. And exactly the same thing we see even in severe stroke patients. So benefit across, across the board for all of, those, uh, all of those patients. So hopefully I've persuaded you that it's a good thing to give thrombolysis. Um, but how do we give it? Well, here's maybe some top tips for success. Um, some of which uh, from our unit um, in the UK, some of which from other units in the UK and also worldwide. I think one of the key things is to know that your stroke patient is coming so you can, um, you can be aware of them and uh, organise yourselves as, uh, appropriately. So we have a pre-alert where the ambulance or the first responder will ring straight through to the stroke unit. The nurses on the stroke unit will then alert CT so that CT scanner won't take some difficult case such as some CT guided biopsy or whatever. Um, and of course the stroke physician needs to uh, be alert. I, I need to know that I, uh, I need to make myself ready to go down to the ED or wherever it is that the stroke patient will come into. Important that the team knows in advance what they're doing. Um, so we all have clearly defined roles. Uh, the nurse knows what they're doing, the doctor knows what they're doing, the senior doctor, junior doctor and so on. Time is crucial, as I've already said, so don't waste precious minutes on dressing patients. I think a perfectly adequate examination for these purposes can be done with a patient dressed. No need to do an ECG straight away. That can wait for later. The important thing is to get the patient to the scanner so you can decide what treatment's appropriate. Nurses on the ward can pre-prepare the infusion once they know the patient weight. And if we take the drug with us, we can give the bolus on the, in the CT scanning room. And all these shave off precious minutes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid generally to give thrombolysis. Um, but particularly, I'd say, don't be afraid to give uh, thrombolysis to patients with mild strokes, with low NIHSS scores. I've shown that even those patients benefit. People worry that, well, what if this isn't a stroke? What if this is a functional syndrome? Uh, well, again, uh, the risks of treating a functional uh, stroke are very, very low. The risks of bleeding within a brain which is normal are virtually nil. And Gary Ford from Oxford has said that if you're not thrombolizing functional strokes, you're really not thrombolizing enough. And I think I'd agree with that. Just a quick word about CT scans. Of course, we do CT scans to distinguish hemorrhagic stroke from ischemic stroke. Whereas there's a common myth that we're doing these scans to help diagnose strokes, which we're not, of course. The, stroke may, the, the CT may well be normal. And indeed, in lacuna syndromes, perhaps as many as 40% of CT scans, especially in the early stages, will be normal. Or it might be that the, the changes are very subtle. And here is a thrombus in the middle cerebral artery on the right-hand side. And in the same patient, um, the loss of the lentiform, uh, sorry, the insular ribbon on the left-hand side, sorry, left-hand side. Um, both of these changes in early, early change in CT and ischemic stroke. But it really doesn't matter if you don't see these or not. Just the point to make is the CT scan may be pretty unremarkable or may well be normal. That's not the crucial thing of the diagnosis.
the crucial thing is looking for those sudden focal loss. So it's onset of sudden uh, symptoms, focal symptoms, and negative, uh, negative symptoms, so a loss of power rather than positive symptoms, shaking or tingling or so on. So much for ischemic stroke. What about hemorrhagic stroke? Well, this makes up perhaps about 15% of strokes in the UK, a greater percentage in other parts of the world. And generally, hemorrhagic strokes are more severe than ischemic strokes. They have a bad prognosis. But, and perhaps because they often present with um, severe headache, with decreased consciousness, they often present uh, earlier than ischemic strokes. So they can present early and therefore give us the opportunities to deliver swift treatments. These might well include uh, the following, which have all recently um, been shown to be have, uh, have some uh, benefits in the management of um, hemorrhagic stroke. Um, Anticoagulant-associated bleeds, whether warfarin or DOAX, control of blood pressure. And also we can consider hemostatic agents. Of course, in terms of anticoagulants, we're normally talking warfarin. Again, time is of the essence. And if we can have near-patient testing, either in the stroke unit or in the ED, then it saves having to wait for a long time for the INR to come back. If we can have uh, protocols for rapid PCC administration, so whereby you don't necessarily have to have a hematologist to give you the say-so, where perhaps you keep the PCC close to um, where you'll be delivering it, in the ED or on the stroke unit. So all these things can save precious minutes. In terms of blood pressure, so some recent evidence that there's benefit in treating blood pressure in, in hemorrhagic stroke. So in ischemic stroke, we, we, it's less clear what we should be doing acutely, but in hemorrhagic stroke, certainly increasing evidence that we should be intervening. The, inter the Interact 2 trial, um, the treatment arm, was aggressively treatment treating patients with a systolic blood pressure of 150 or greater, trying to treat them early and bringing their blood pressure down to 140 or lower and continuing that treatment out to seven days. And certainly this was associated with decreased hematoma expansion and a suggestion that there were some improved functional outcomes as a result. The outcomes perhaps less, uh, more modest than might have been hoped for, uh, perhaps for, the, for some of the following reasons. Few patients were randomized within that first hour. Uh, the treatment between the, the, the blood pressure differences between the treatment arm and the um, aggressive arm were relatively modest and large volume bleeds were excluded, but certainly some suggestion that it might be beneficial. Looking then at hemostatic agents, um, tranosamic acid, we were involved um, uh, with the TITCH2 trial uh, based in Nottingham which randomized people to receive transamic acid. And again, some suggestion that perhaps some small effect on early death, but it was certainly safe, and perhaps if given more widely globally, might well lead to some improved outcomes for what is otherwise um, severe strokes. Okay, so much for individualized treatments. What about, um, what about organizational care? So, this is a table looking at the effect of treatments um, on patients. So if we look at thrombolysis, so, so the pale gray, second down on the left, that's early thrombolysis. And clearly in terms of the middle column there, the number of 12 uh, death or dependent patients um, saved per 100 patients treated is certainly a very powerful treatment, but of course can't be given to all patients with stroke. Uh, whereas acute, taking to patients for an acute stroke unit can be, this can be delivered to 100% of patients, not just with ischemic stroke, but hemorrhagic stroke as well. And as you can see, it has a very powerful effect. And really, by stroke unit, we're just meaning pay, pay, uh, a unit where uh, the staff are, um, have received education in how to look after stroke, uh, where there's enthusiasm, where there's an MDT that meets generally. So there's nothing that's not beyond uh, uh, the grasp of a lot of us. And actually, I think there's good evidence to suggest that if you um, do uh, start a thrombolysis service, then that generates momentum which improves the team performance as a whole. So stroke units and organized care is very important. Okay. What about secondary prevention? Well, we heard a little yesterday about the effects of cinnamon tea, which um, 
yes, is claimed to have all sorts of benefits and certainly does have, um, you know, pharmacological uh, basis behind it. Um, in terms of blood pressure then, it's not a question just of bringing down the blood pressure in total. But here's some uh, graph following on from Peter Rothwell's work in, in, in Oxford. So looking at the ASCOT blood pressure lowering arm, um, it showed that uh, the benefits in, uh, there was a greater number of strokes prevented and death and disability prevented in the amlodipine arm compared to the calcium channel, uh, compared to the beta blocker arm, even though the effects on blood pressure were very similar. Um, why was that? Well, if you look more closely at the uh, blood pressure variability, then the calcium channel blocker arm certainly had a decreased variability in blood pressure, whereas there were spikes of peaks and troughs in the beta blocker arm. And it's postulated that it's these peaks of blood pressure that are particularly harmful in leading, leading to a prolonged ischemic damage and uh, microvascular changes and microbleeds. So perhaps the agent is important. And this was rep similar findings in the MRC trial looking at thiazides against beta blockers. So what about atrial fibrillation? Well, it's certainly very important, and one in, stroke, one in six strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. Um, they cause bad strokes by whatever measure, whether it's mor mortality or um, de uh, disability or um, whether you're likely to return home after your stroke. So um, these are certainly you know, very serious, and I think looking for atrial fibrillation is a vital thing. Perhaps less mention of atrial fibrillation here in Sri Lanka, but I, I wonder whether it's because it's one of these things that, you know, if you don't look, you don't see. If you don't open your eyes, you won't be able to see something. And certainly if you just do a single ECG in the emergency department, then your chances of picking up, um, picking up atrial fibrillation are pretty low. If you repeat the ECG, um, uh, on the unit two or three times, then certainly that'll, that'll improve things. 24-hour monitoring will certainly increase things again. But if you really want to be looking for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which of course will carry with it um, just as severe a risk as established atrial fibrillation, then we really need to be thinking about longer-term monitoring and uh, potentially implantable loop recorders or something similar. But certainly look hard for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the commonest cause of stroke in elderly patients in the UK over the age of 70, 75, and is the commonest um, cause of stroke um, when we can't otherwise find a cause. Um, so uh, so-called cryptogenic stroke. Then paroxysmal for atrial fibrillation is, is frequently the culprit. But again, people worry about bleeding in uh, anticoagulation. And, and of course, you know, that is, that is a risk. But people are particularly worried about bleeding in the elderly population. But of course, it's just this population that has the highest uh, relative risk of stroke. So um, their absolute risk of stroke is huge. So, if you look at the, uh, the benefits of uh, anticoagulating elderly patients, then compared to a younger age group, the older patient has more to win in terms of net benefit because of their higher absolute risk. So in summary, I would suggest that it's important to remember that stroke is common and certainly, as I've shown, very serious. And the prompt and accurate diagnosis is crucial, is crucial in effective management of stroke patients. I think key to remember is that thrombolysis is not only safe, but it's effective. And I think we should be moving from the time when we think of thrombolysis as something, uh, an add-on, and we should be thinking it really very much as a standard treatment. And certainly I would suggest that you're more likely to run into trouble for not thrombolizing a patient than for thrombolizing them. And certainly that would be my own experience. Patients accept that there are risks with treatments, but what they don't accept is that, that treatments are denied them. 
And then finally, I would say that, of course, targeted and appropriate secondary prevention is vital. I'd just like to thank all of my colleagues in the stroke team at Sherwood Forest Hospitals. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper, for that excellent talk on stroke. Uh, since we are running out of time, we'll, uh, we have to conclude the session, and I'll, I'll, I'll invite Dr. Priyankara Jayavardhana, Vice President of SLISM, to hand over the token of appreciation to Dr. Cooper.